helped heal, heal themselves in avoiding surgery through diet. And this past April, his second book, The Plant Paradox, hit the bookstores and is now a New York Times bestseller. So we're going to talk a little bit about that book today, find out a little bit more about Dr. Gundry and his research and his practice. He practices medicine at the Center for Restorative Medicine and International Health Heart and Lung Institute in Palm Springs and in Santa Barbara, California. And of course, we will include all of his contact information in the show notes. So don't uh, worry about getting those contact pieces and websites and YouTube channels and LinkedIn links <laughs> and all of that. We'll do that at the end. So I am really excited to do this. I think it's going to be a very interesting discussion today. So thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Gundry. Well, I really appreciate the invite. So I know I touched very briefly and quickly on your very impressive history in this little bio, but let's start by letting our listeners find out a little bit more about you and how you ended up going from performing heart surgery to writing <laughs> a book. <laughs> it seems like a large leap. Well, um, going back into the dark ages, uh, in, uh, I had an undergraduate uh, experience at Yale University where I actually got to design my own major. And um, my major was in human evolutionary biology. And my thesis, which I had to defend, was you could take a great ape manipulate its environment and manipulate its food supply and predict that you would arrive at a human. And I actually successfully defended my thesis. And then I handed it off to my parents for safekeeping and went to medical school, um, became actually a very famous heart surgeon, chairman and professor at Loma Linda University. I uh, invented a bunch of medical devices that bear my name that are the most widely used devices to protect the heart during heart surgery. I and my partner, Leonard Bailey, did all the baby heart transplants that people may remember. And then in uh, about 15, 16 years ago, I was confronted with a 48-year-old man from Miami, Florida, who I, I call Big Ed in both of my books, who uh, was quite obese and had inoperable coronary artery disease. His blood vessels were so clogged up that you couldn't put stents in them. You couldn't do bypasses because there wasn't any place to sew the bypasses to. And Big Ed, like many people in his state, uh, went around to famous medical centers looking for basically someone dumb enough to operate on him. And Big Ed had been doing this for about six months when he came to me at Loma Linda uh, because I'm famous for being dumb enough to operate on people that nobody else wants to. So I looked at the angiogram, the movie of Big Ed's coronary arteries that he, he had had done six months before. And I said, you know, Big Ed, um, I don't turn many people down, but I, get, I agree with everybody else who's seen you that there's nothing that we can do for you. And he says, well, yeah, I know, everybody said that, but let me tell you what I've been up to. I've been on a diet and I've lost 45 pounds in six months. Now, this was a man who weighed 265 pounds sitting across from me, uh, there by his name, Big Ed. And he says, I went to a health food store and I've been taking all these supplements. And he literally has a shopping bag full of supplements. And he says, you know, maybe I did something in my body with all this. And so I'm looking at Big Ed saying, well, you know, good for you for losing weight, but that's not going to clean out your coronary arteries. And I know what you did with all the supplements. You made expensive urine. And I actually really believe that. And he said, well, you know, come on, I've come all the way across country. What would it hurt to get another angiogram, another movie of my heart? And I sighed and said, ah, okay. So we got a new angiogram, and in six months' time, this guy had cleaned out 50% of the blockages in his coronary arteries. They were gone. Now, it was actually quite the most remarkable thing I think I've seen. And not knowing what I know now, I was delighted because there were actually now places to do bypasses. And I happily took him to the operating room the next day and did a five-vessel bypass, and he did fine. So after we're all done, I'm 
you know, talking to Big Ed, and I go, so tell me about this diet that you did. And he said, well, you know, here's what I did, and here's what involved, and about two sentences into this diet, I said, time out. This is the diet that I wrote, changed an ape into a human, and oh my gosh. And so I actually called up my parents in San Diego and said, do you still have my thesis? And they said, oh yeah, yeah. it's here in the shrine next to the you know, eternal flame. And I said, well, send it up to me. Now, why this was so interesting is because I was a big fat heart surgeon. I was about 70 pounds overweight. I had pre-diabetes, I had migraine headaches, I had arthritis, I had hypertension. And I was running 30 miles a week. I was going to the gym one hour every day, and I was eating a healthy, low-fat vegetarian diet at Loma Linda. And, you know, I was doing all these right things, and here I was, you know, with all these problems. And so then I said, so, Big Ed, you know, let me look in that bag of supplements. And I start looking through his supplements, and as I mentioned, I'm very famous for protecting hearts. And down in the lab... I was actually using a lot of these supplements intravenously to uh, keep hearts alive for 48 hours sitting in a bucket of ice water for heart transplant. And it never occurred to me to swallow these things. So uh, I started myself on my experiment of following my thesis and my staff noticed the difference right away. And my blood work, I every couple months sent up to the University of California, Berkeley. And lo and behold, all my blood work changed. And so I started putting my patients that I had operated on at Loma Linda on this program. And after about a year of this and seeing that not only did their cholesterol numbers change and their diabetes went away and we threw away their high blood pressure medications, uh, Everything changed just by telling them what to eat and sending them to Costco or Trader Joe's to buy a few supplements. So I actually resigned my position at Loma Linda 15 years ago and uh, set up a a center, uh, initially in Palm Springs, where I basically asked people, to play with me as uh, as their as my research project and their research project, and every three months we'd send blood work off that Medicare or insurance would pay for to various labs around the country uh, for some really interesting things that we could monitor, and I'd ask them to change certain foods in their uh, diet, and I'd ask them to take certain supplements, and I started publishing my data. And immediately, I really saw some interesting trends that resulted in my first book, which you mentioned, Dr. Gundry's Diet Evolution. Now, after that book was published, there were a number of patients who had um, fibromyalgia or autoimmune diseases who um, their fibromyalgia and their autoimmune disease went away by following my program. So I got pretty inundated with autoimmune patients uh, after that book. And in fact, my practice... 50% of my practice is now autoimmune patients. And so we were able to develop, uh, working with a couple of labs, some very intricate tests, looking at inflammatory markers that aren't on available blood tests. And through the years, I've now published on taking away certain plant compounds that are called lectins, and that's L-E-C-T-I-N-S. Some people think I'm saying leptin, which is a fat storage hormone, or lecithin, which is a emollient that we use to make chocolate smooth. Uh, it's lectin. And that got me very interested in these plant compounds. Um, as a way of explaining lectins, lectins are the one of the major plant defense systems against being eaten. And one of the things that's very hard for either myself or just about anybody to get our arms wrapped around plants is that plants uh, don't like us. They were actually here first, long before we or other animals arrived. And 
plants had it pretty doggone good because no one wanted to eat them. And as strange as it may seem, plants don't want to be eaten. They have a life. And they absolutely don't want their babies eaten, their seeds. So they, when animals arrived, plants had a problem because they couldn't run, they couldn't hide, they couldn't fight. But they were chemists of incredible ability. So they use a protein that's called a lectin to make the animal that eats them or their babies sick or not feel well or be in pain or get anxious. Uh, all sorts of fascinating effects that have been well described and which I describe in my book, The Plant Paradox. And the idea is a smart animal will say, you know, every time I eat this plant or eat these plant seeds or babies, I don't thrive, I don't do well, I don't reproduce well, uh, and I'm not going to eat this plant anymore. The plant wins, the animal wins, everybody's happy. Then humans arrive. Uh, as most of us know, humans are pretty stupid. And so when we eat things that make us depressed or anxious or make us hurt, uh, we keep eating them and take a leave or Advil or Nexium or Prilosec or uh, Prozac, not understanding that the plant is really desperately trying to get our attention to stop what we're doing. And so what I found was when I asked people to take away uh, the major mischievous lectins in their diet, and we can talk about that as we go along, that all of a sudden, these very sophisticated markers of inflammation uh, return to normal. And more importantly, uh, we look at about 20 markers of autoimmune diseases. And as I published, uh, these markers went away uh, and re normalized uh, once we eliminated these lectins. And we've also found that if we reintroduce lectins, uh, either by choice or almost by accident, that these markers will come back up positive. So that, um, after looking at thousands of patients, that uh, prompted me to publish my new book, The Plant Paradox, as a guide to you know, who's your friends and who aren't your friends in the plant world. And that's why it's called The Plant Paradox, uh, because I'm a uh, confirmed plant predator. Uh, I consider myself